James McRae. Hello. Thanks for being here. I'm so excited to chat with you today. It's great to be here. It's great to be with Thought Catalog and it's great to be in New York City. Yes. So you're back after mm -hmm. a long pause, or I should say you really just moved, but how, how has it been? You're a little south of us now. Yeah. Well, I left New York at the end of 2019, just before the world started to change, change quite <laughs> for a bit. Sure. I lived in LA for a year and nice. now I live in Austin, Texas which I love, but it's so great being back here in New York. You move towards the warm places. It looks like you've been in the sense of paradise. Listen, at least I, to us. I grew up in Minnesota <laughs> and I lived in New York City for eight years. So I have lived through my share of winters. You've and done enough. Yeah, you've I'm dealt done. with it. You're I'm, done. <laughs> I'm, re I'm retired from winter. I don't blame you at all. I'm, I think everyone in New York feels like they're retired from winter yes. and just can't escape it. But Thanks for coming, and I'm so excited to chat with you about all things, including your book, which we love to see. Not to mention, you have one of the coolest covers in the Thought Catalog. I don't know, I would say, I, I just think this might be the coolest cover ever. It just reflects all the things you do, um, pun intended. But hmm. I want to start by asking, like, what's a day like this look like for you? I know you've been traveling, you're in New York. Like, How do you start your day before you do all the things you do, which we'll dive into in a little bit? I've got a pretty consistent morning routine. Give it to me, please. Because I love morning my morning time is my creative time. Mm. And I really treat my creative practice almost like a spiritual practice mm. or a ritual. I love that. So I like to write in the morning because I feel like that's when the channel is most clear. Yes. So once I start getting distracted by obligations and, you know, oh, just yeah. meetings, then it's really hard to get back into that creative zone. Sure. So I start every day by making a big pot of Herba Mate tea. So good. And I meditate every morning for like 15 minutes. And then I just really sit down with an open notebook and just try to see what wants to come through that day. And it might be a meme, it might be a poem, yeah. um, it might be a book. Um, so I just like to carve out at least a few hours every morning just to get into that flow and just no pressure, but just see what comes through and just play with whatever ideas you know, come around. I love that. Yeah, uninterrupted, like no phones, like right when you wake up, who are you, right? Like no outer influences, which is so hard to come by these totally. days, as you know. Makes me want to ask, by the way, about your title. And I'm going to go reference this because yeah. I want to get it right. You title yourself as a post-apocalyptic psychedelic meme poet. I can honestly say I've never met a post-apocalyptic psychedelic meme poet until now. So big moment for me. But also I want to ask like how you came up with that title because that is, it feels like it opens a universe right when I just say that. I didn't come up with that myself. Really? I think someone left a comment on my Instagram calling me that. That's a pretty thoughtful And I just comment. decided to go with it and put it in my bio for I a while. That. And I like to, with my writing and my memes, I try to push it a little bit and make it a little, make things a little bit more absurd and a little bit more outrageous. Right. So instead of saying, oh, I'm a, an artist or a poet, I thought it would be funny if I just used that phrase and said post-apocalyptic psychedelic meme poet, which I think like somewhat describes the flavor of the work that I'm doing. It definitely <laughs> sets a tone and I have to say, it made me more excited to meet you in person because I feel like I see such a reflection of you online through mm -hmm. your work, but this, it just, it all adds up. It's fun, it's out there, it like makes you think and I think it also makes people grab for your book, which is cool. Mm -hmm. But I want to start with the memes, right? Because that's mm -hmm. like such a huge part of what you do. When did meme culture inf infiltrate your life? Because personally, I know we're all on the internet and it just inherently mm -hmm. becomes a part of pop culture, right? Because it's there. When did you start getting into memes or when did like this become a part of your creative, you know, journey, I guess? I started making memes after listening to a YouTube video with Terrence McKenna, who's like a, a psychedelic philosopher. Mm -hmm. And he would talk about memes in the 80s and 90s. And a meme, classically speaking, is just a viral idea, right. like something that can, you know, be spread from one mind to another to another and kind of go viral throughout a culture. Mm -hmm. And I realized that through poetry and especially memes, I could address 
certain topics in a way that was able to cut through the clutter mm -hmm. and like not take a hard stance with any particular position and get into that the game of like argumentative absolutes that people um, are in in a very yeah. polarized world. And it's a way just to kind of communicate in a way that is, is more effective yeah, and sure. um, hits you in the gut instead of in the mind. That can come with a little bit of laughter right. and it can, it, it, it's really just a, an effective way of communicating. And I decided to start playing around with the medium of the internet meme as a format for creating art. Mm, I love that. I love how you said it's like, it gets you in the gut. Like, I agree, it really does cut through because it's not as like intimidating as like a news article or a long caption that's like, you know, four paragraphs and you're mm -hmm. like, all right, well, I'm either in or I'm out, you know? It feels so much easier to digest. And what I love about your work is that it almost feels like they're extensions of personal downloads you get. I know that's like a big claim, but even just hearing your morning, you know, routine, it kind of like, I see that in what you do. So I'm guessing you look at memes as like a form of communication then. Do you prefer it uh, versus writing per se, or how do you feel? It's like an aspect it? of art. I yeah. think I think memes are an evolution of communication and art. Mm -hmm. So if you look at art throughout history, it you never quite know what the art of that particular generation is during the times. Like mm -hmm. for example, when Andy Warhol was making his silkscreen paintings, right. the art world didn't really accept him because they said, oh, he's just, he's just silk screening images from pop culture onto a canvas. Like that's not real art, right. but history proved that it was real art. And the same with um, Jean-Michel Basquiat mm -hmm. and Keith Haring, who were graffiti artists here in New York. And at the time in the, let's say early eighties, no one considered graffiti to be a real art form. And it turns out it was. So artists are always using the tools and technology of their time to create art. And I think that if you look at what are the tools and technology of our time, 2022, it's the internet, mm -hmm. it's social media, mm -hmm. and it's memes. So I think that there are a lot of meme artists out there and people making social media content that it might seem a little frivolous to, to some people, but if you can do it in a way, because I made, I wrote poetry for a long time before I started making memes. And I thought like, well, what if I can apply the mindset of poetry and, you know, addressing some maybe bigger, even existential topics yeah. through memes? Because people don't read as much as they used to. They don't read poetry as much as they used to. Right. So I think it's um, important for artists to embrace the tools and technology that people are using to create content, art, writing in a way that's going to resonate with people. Exactly. And you built such a following off of just doing that. And the way I look at your work too is very exactly what you're saying. I almost feel like you're someone that's very intrinsic. You go dig deep, you pull things out, you journal it out, whatever, and then you release it to the world and you get a ton of reactions as you have this community now. Have you ever found that part of your presence on the internet tiring or, or difficult? Because I feel like you are putting yourself out there in such a way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's cool, you know? It's, it's amazing that I can be writing something in my notebook that just came through to me. Like I just, right. I might just have an idea and I put it in a notebook and then I might make a meme or a poem and then immediately post it. Mm -hmm. And it's like this idea that I just had 10 minutes ago is now being consumed by the tens of thousands of people. <laughs> you know, some of the, the haters might <laughs> say like, well, it's not as good as like giving someone a full book or a more of a longer form you know, piece of content to consume. But I actually think it's even more intimate and impactful because if you post something every day, then people are getting a little micro hit of yeah. your art every day. And over the course of a year, I compare it to, speaking of psychedelics, mm -hmm. you know, one theme in psychedelics today that's trending is the idea of microdosing, yes. taking a very small amount on a daily or weekly basis where you don't get this overwhelming experience, 
but you get a little bit of medicine that sinks in over time. Yeah. So I often think that using Instagram and making memes, it's almost like people are microdosing your work. That's, so, that's so such a great way of looking at they, it. They, they don't live that. with the book for a weeks at a time, but every day they get a little hit mm -hmm. and then you kind of live with them and you can kind of work the medicine over the course of years with a person. Right, that's, so, that's such a fun way of looking at it. And also this idea of an algorithm pushing content without people being able to necessarily control it. It's almost like you pop in when people need you. You yeah. know, like I kind of, I believe in divine timing in that sense. Um, but I want to dive into the psychedelics a bit more because I can't hear psychedelic meme poet and not ask, how has that played a role in your work? Or how do you incorporate that into your life? Is it something you're frequently partaking in or what's your yeah. experience with it? I wouldn't say that I'm frequently partaking in psychedelics, but they have been a big um, kind of a teacher and a guide in my life. And I think that all substances have their place, mm -hmm. especially in the creative process, you know, whether that's coffee or alcohol or cannabis or right. psychedelics. So for me, I think psychedelics help to just open up that channel of intuition. Mm -hmm. So I certainly wouldn't use it to create something like that's not the role it plays in my creative process. But I think having experienced psychedelic medicines in, you know, shamanic scenarios has really helped me put um, my intuition at the forefront of my creative process. And it's allowed me to connect a little more with my heart and get out of my head. Yes. Ugh. Something a lot of us need, and especially people that read your book, which by the way, I want to dive into. When did this all start? Do you remember when you wrote the first poem that went into this book? Do you, was it an existential crisis that kind of spiraled this entire project? Or when did you know? Because mm -hmm. this was a lot. I could tell this was a huge part of who you are and mm -hmm. what you've experienced. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I think I do remember the first poems that came out and I was still living in New York mm -hmm. and I was having a bit of an existential crisis because for me growing up, I was very much an artist. Mm -hmm. I was always writing poetry, drawing, making paintings and I went to art school. And then fast forward to 2019, I'm working in the advertising industry on Madison Avenue very demanding. Thick of New York type of corporate life. <laughs> very much, very much in the thick of it. And I was losing the passion for my work. Mm. And I was kind of just a little depressed because I just wasn't the, 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 the inner artist and the inner child was not being cared for. Yeah. So I had not written poetry for many years and I was having this just existential crisis with my work and my life and I feel like I started writing poetry almost as a coping mechanism mm -hmm. because that's what started to come through. Like I, I almost had to surrender to the, the burden that I was carrying mm -hmm. and return to that inner artist and that inner child and that came in through the form of poetry. Mm -hmm. and that just got me going and I just kept doing it and it really hasn't stopped since then. I love that, I love that. And I feel like in this book, you're able to see how, like what you were describing before, the memes really do like tie in almost as like, they dance with the poems in mm. a way. Like there's so many fun layouts here. Like one page, it's an alien greeting you and being like, don't worry, I feel you. And then the other page, it's a, like kind of like a deeper, darker graphic that plays into those like more existential thoughts. but. I feel like it's so digestible as a mm -hmm. read and I can tell that it's been like little bite-sized pieces of your brain. Yeah. Um, how, how has it been like using this as an outlet during this really crazy time in the world, of course, at large? I mean, do you feel like this was your escape? Did, was this an easy way to almost cope with those things we were dealing with? Because I can imagine too, humor can be in a sense of escapism at times. Yeah, you know, it was really a journey for me to just embrace being an artist again. And that kind of gave me a new path forward. Mm -hmm. And the humor is just so important to laugh at life. You know, we tend to take things so seriously, especially when the world is crazy. Yeah. It's really easy to just get caught up in the struggle and to, 
you know, let your consciousness be infected by the chaos. Yeah. And just laughter is healing. Laughter is medicine and creativity is healing and creativity is medicine. So just getting up every morning excited to create something, draw something, write something, that has been such uh, amazing medicine for me mm -hmm. just to kind of get through the world today and, and, and to inspire other people to create. And I feel like we can only get out of the crazy state of the world by you know, returning to our hearts, awakening the inner child and the inner artist and creating a better world. So I just feel like now is the time to be, to be more creative, to introduce more play into our lives, into the world, mm -hmm. and to be able to laugh at ourselves and each other as we're all just trying to get by together. I love that and I love that angle on this book because I think some people could read the title, right? How to Laugh and Ironic Amusement During Your Existential Crisis and get stuck in the existential crisis of it, you know? Because mm -hmm. we are conditioned to just fixate and ruminate and just spiral. Mm -hmm. I think our, if there's anything our society is able to help us do, it's spiral, especially with media. So I love that that's your angle on this. And I can honestly say I was smiling most of the time I was reading this mm. and laughing audibly <laughs> at times too, especially with your lizard story. I was laughing <laughs> real hard. Um, you'll have to read it to obviously understand. But with that being said, I, I wanna talk about the duality in this book because there's a lot of play there, um, kind of like tug of war, if you will, with these concepts. Um, I wanna just like toss you one and see what you could say off the top. First one that you touch on a lot is small self versus highest self. Mm -hmm. When you hear that, what do you think of? Are we our highest selves right now, by the way? Yeah, I think we're both. I mean, I, the simple way to say it is that the smaller self is the ego mm -hmm. or the mind mm -hmm. or the intellect. And the higher self is the soul or even your own intuition. Mm. And to be a functioning human being, you need to have a good balance of both. Right, you so know, you, true. Need, you need to use your mind, your intelligence, your ego which gives you a sense of identity and, and place and purpose. Mm -hmm. um, but the soul is really the navigator and the intuition is what gives you, you know, direction. So mm -hmm. it's very important to have a healthy ego and a healthy connection with your own intuition. Mm. I like that because when I first looked at those two written out on paper, I immediately thought they're almost like, at war, like, you know, you want one and you don't want the other. I like that they have to get along, you know? There's yeah. an aspect of that but that's the ego, the ego should be the sidekick of the intuition. Mm. Not, that part, not that the, part. Not the other way around. I like that, and most people struggle with that. Mm -hmm. My, myself at times, mm -hmm. as we all do. Um, breakdown versus breakthrough. Hmm. So a breakdown provides us with the opportunity for a breakthrough. Mm. It's a moment of grace mm. because you have to die to be reborn. Yes. And that happens on an ongoing basis throughout each of our lives. Mm -hmm. So every time I've had a breakdown, it was just the breakdown of an old version of me mm -hmm. that had to break down in order to give birth to the next version of me. Level up. So they really way. are like, they go hand in hand. I love that. Love that. Last one feels very existential, but living versus dying. Living versus dying, um, two sides of the same coin. <laughs> I, I, I tend to think that there is only life mm -hmm. and there is only consciousness. Mm -hmm. And we're currently experiencing eternity through you know, this lens. Yeah. And I think death is just a transition into another lens in which to view the same eternity. Mm, I like that. Mm. It ties into like just spirituality as a whole, which I want to dive into with you in a bit as well, because um, this whole thing feels like a spiritual journey, you know, like, and I think we can all relate to how chaotic the past few years have been in terms of self-discovery, identity. Yeah. I mean, going back to like, who am I? Where am I? What's my job? What do I, you know, the things that society has told us are like in, we're in control of and what we should be in control of. We lost that. So I love that. I love the idea of like, you don't have to worry about really anything. You know, it's all part of the plan. It's all part of the process. And 
the creative process too and spiritual process. A quote that stuck with me though from your book I want to uh, mention, mm -hmm. it's from a longer poem, but mm -hmm. it reads, the right hand blaming the left hand for the body's genetic pain. I had to sit with this for a second because it just felt too relevant to exactly what you were saying before, this, these polarizing opposites. We've all been pushed to like one corner and it's right. like, choose your side, right? Um, and it just feels like we're always blaming each other. We're never, we're never really actually together. Um, when, like moments like that, or do you, poems like this, are there multiple meanings on purpose? Does it come to you as one and then you discover it? Because that just felt mm -hmm. like, like. Yeah, that just popped into my head. It's, it's in a poem called Humanity Is, mm -hmm. and I was really just looking for all types of different little snapshots to describe what humanity mm -hmm. is from all these different angles and metaphors, the good and the bad, the beautiful and the painful. And blaming the right hand, blaming the left hand on the body's genetic pain is definitely a reference to humanity as a whole where, you know, if the body has some type of an ailment that is genetic, let's say, the right hand blaming the left hand is completely unproductive. You know, the whole body needs healing mm -hmm. and the hands are, need to work together as part of that healing process. Mm -hmm. So comparing that to the collective of humanity, mm -hmm. you know, the right and the left, obviously, in terms of the political spectrum yes. or you can divide up people in any number of ways. And my thought was, you know, this side is blaming this side and this side is blaming this side. At the end of the day, it's just unproductive as one hand blaming the other. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, the body can't be healed until the entire body is healed. And we as individuals cannot truly be healed until the entire collective is healed. Mm -hmm. So I feel like, you know, finding ways to work together and come together and not fall for the trap of division is going to be our best way to get out of the mess that we're in. So true. So true. Oh, well, James, I'd love to dive into rabbit holes with you, which I don't think many people can say is a fun thing to dive into, but today it will be. And I want to start with a line from the book that I love, which is the last line in your book. It says the darkness will not stay. This feels like a theme we're constantly relearning in life, like, you know, these existential moments just like in a black hole. But I really loved this. I feel like it was the perfect closure to the book for me. And I wanted to ask you, like, how do you pull yourself out of those dark holes or places when you're in that? Has writing always been that for you or what practices do you play? Into? Yeah, I, I mean, creativity is kind of my main wellness practice. <laughs> you know, I think there's so many benefits to it. But in addition to that, there's so many tools I picked up on this journey. Back when I lived in New York, I started my yoga and meditation practice. Mm -hmm. Spent years doing kundalini yoga oh, wow. and meditation and breath work. Um, we even mentioned, you know, psychedelics and even microdosing, yeah. which can be very helpful um, to maintain a good mental health. Overall, I really think that consciousness is like soil mm -hmm. and whatever you use to nurture the soil or whatever seeds you plant is ultimately going to grow. Mm. So I'm very careful about what I kind of allow into my orbit, whether it's, you know, media or, you know, food and chemicals, even you know, people, yeah. you know, being around the right people that are going to be more uplifting as opposed to kind of um, dragging you down. Sure. So it's just really important to have like good, to, to tend to the soil of your consciousness mm. in order to grow the plants that you want to grow and, you know, flowers instead of weeds. Yes. Oh, I love that because there's so many things that could just kill the garden, you know, <laughs> especially now. I'm wondering like with that shift, were there ever any major changes you didn't expect that were kind of curveballs that just happened in front of you? And you're like, oh, well, that's no longer my life, I guess, okay. I mean, yeah, here and there. I mean, there are, I think that when you start to evolve as a human, you're gonna get resistance in your life, mm -hmm. whether, you know, certain friends, you know, might not like to see you growing and changing and they might, be resentful right. and then you've got to make a decision about you know 
that friendship. Right. Or you might love to, you know, eat a certain food or, or like maybe you're addicted to watching news and then you suddenly see like, oh man, you can kind of see it for what it is and be like, this is just programming me to see the world through, you know, a fear-based perspective. Right. And then you have to, you know, make a decision to, you know, cut certain things out of your life. Totally. Oh my gosh. Yeah. And I feel like it's really hard when you realize that the world as we see it very bluntly, you know, like black and white, what is it? Like, you know, the way we were talking about before, like these extreme sides we're pushed to, or just these very like highs and lows that we're always presented with in media. When you realize you don't have to necessarily invest your, all your energy into that or buy not necessarily not buy into that if something's reality, but to say like, it doesn't serve you to necessarily focus on it. It's hard to shift out of those spaces. And I'm sure too, yeah. like, was that something that was difficult for you? Like growing into where you are now as a healer and communicator and just a spiritual person on the internet? Yeah, you know, I think it's, it's easy for people to, cause I, we all want to, the world to be a better place. Yeah. And we want, and we all recognize that there is a lot of imperfection and chaos and pain and injustice mm -hmm. in the world. Mm -hmm. And I would hope that we all want to make the world a better place. And the instinct is often to get caught up in the wave of outrage mm -hmm. yeah. and to lose your own sense of center and balance. And I think that we can serve the world better when we learn to serve ourselves first, meaning regulate the nervous system, have a calm, clear mind, yes. and approach our acts of service from a place of personal wholeness, mm -hmm. because only then are we in a position to be of service to others. We yes. need to heal ourselves before we can heal the world. So true, so true. That ties into the community side, which we talked to talked about a little bit mm -hmm. earlier. And I want to ask you too, how has building a community or finding the people find you, especially online, helped you on your journey? You know, kind of get that affirmation around your work and the things you put out there. Mm -hmm. Community is everything. And thank God for the internet. Like I have so many good internet friends. Mm -hmm. And many of them have become my real life friends. Mm -hmm. And it, it's so helpful to know that there are other people out there that are feeling and thinking the same. And to me, it's a testament of you can only get as close to others and know others as deeply as you know yourself, mm. right? So when you put yourself out there from a true authentic place, you're going to attract a tribe of people that resonate with that. Yes. If you're putting out a fake, inauthentic, forced version of yourself, you're gonna find people in your life that are also putting on a fake, inauthentic version of themselves. All the it's a masquerade party. For Absolutely. A while. <laughs> Everybody just playing a role. No, and that's so relevant to how we all maneuver now too. I think after the crazy couple of years we've had, it socially, there's been a lot of challenges because there's been a lot of intrinsic growth for people um, or, you know, pain that we've been through universally. But I want to ask, um, and I know this is a very existential crisis of sorts, but after 159 pages, how do you laugh in ironic amusement during your existential crisis or crises or whenever they come and go? I hope for you, you're not in a constant state of crisis. This is a, a subtle state of perpetual existential crisis. That's kind of the human condition. Yes. It's kind of being alive. Definitely. You know, for me at this point, because I've gone through several, you know, dark nights of the soul mm -hmm. that make you, you know, question your purpose mm -hmm. and um, feel hopeless. And then I've always risen from those experiences um, as a more complete whole, mm -hmm and elevated version of myself. So now if I'm facing some kind of a challenge, I try to view my life from the perspective of my future self, mm, right? I love that. Because I know that one day, whether it's a year from now or two years from now, I'm gonna look back at this challenge and see how it helped me grow. Mm. 
and I'm going to appreciate it for what it is, even though it doesn't feel good in the moment, it's allowing me to go through a challenge necessary and have that breakdown that's ultimately going to lead to a breakthrough. Mm. Goes back to that. It's always goes back to the breakdown versus breakthrough and what that really is. And I have to say this book has really helped me in recent crisis, modes of crisis. And I'm really excited to see how it helps other people. And I'm just so glad that you've put your work out there in such an authentic way. You know, the way that you've been able to connect with people through your platform is hard to come by these days, truly. And I love that you're spreading something that's from the soul, truly from the soul and the ego out of the picture, or at least as a mm. sidekick. So I'm here for it. And thank you so much for sitting with me and just letting me dive into your mind a little bit more. It's been so lovely. Thank you so much. This is a delightful conversation. I mean, it's a pleasure. Where can people find you online? And more importantly, where can they find your book and laugh with you and grow with you? Yeah. My primary um, online place is Instagram. You can find me at words are vibrations and the link in my bio. You can check out my podcast, buy the book, awesome. etc. cetera. Yay. Amazing. Thank you, James. Thank you. It's been so great chatting. You guys, this has been another thought catalog interview, part of our, as we create series, I'm Pojo and thanks for watching. <laughs>